If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. I'm glad to tell you we are back. Can't remember which episode. Forgive me for that. It's again with General Bowman, former commander, special forces brigade. We are now at the interesting phase of his military career. But first, sir, very welcome to us once again. We Thank are you glad course. you're back. We are glad that you are willing to speak English in public. <laughs> That's a South African joke, by the way. And uh, <laughs> let's talk about Seven Sai. Perhaps you can explain to us what is Seven Sai, where is it, how did you get there? Okay, course. Thank you very much. I think before I start with Seven Sai, a little bit of humor. Uh, just to explain that from 1966, when I and Martin talked first handly, till where we're at now in 1978, 79, 80, our Defense Force developed very positively. Uh, human resources, weight, and equipment. Now, during my term in uh, Pretoria in the Army Gymnasium, if you went to the military hospital, just to set the table for, for the actual story, you were better, and when you get up to go somewhere in the hospital, x-rays or to the pharmacy or so on, you had to put on your service shoes, brown shoes and black shoes if you're in the Air Force, your army pajamas, those blue stripes, look like a uh, person in the asylum, one from the cuckoo's nest or something like that. Then uh, you've got a blue gown, and now believe me, a blue tie as well, that you've got to put on <laughs> with this pajamas. <laughs> and on your head, your cap or your beret, at that stage, uh, predominantly caps. And of course, with a blue belt, and you had to uh, walk around outside the ward in this type of clothes. Okay. This is now really Prussian uh, discipline. And I think it comes from the Second World War. I'm not degrading this. But uh, this was the way it went. Now, in the mid-60s, there was a course at the Corps of Signal School uh, in Pretoria. They call it the RCI, Regimental Signal Instructors, where infantry people are trained in uh, signals, the operation of uh, radio, the training of uh, infantry radio operators, and so forth. And this one character was a staff sergeant, a hard worker, and a very, actually a character, but uh, a very hard worker, and a man you could rely on. And... Their policy with sports parades were if you play tennis during the Wednesday afternoon sports parade, you wear your tennis clothes and you cover it with a tunic and on your head is your cap, in your hand is your racket. If you play rugby, you've got your rugby togs on, you could wear a, a tracksuit as well, but the tunic's got to be there, your cap must be on. And uh, not ball in hand, but there you must stand on the parade ground. You get on parade, and then they divide you in various sports, and the sports parade can uh, take place. Now, this staff kutzer decided the one day, I'm not going to mention his nickname, uh, to do cross country. You need very little equipment for cross country. He had a, a blue army PT brook just above the knee. He had an army vest on, and of course his tunic and a cap, but one thing was sure, he didn't have tackies. And he took shoe shine and he painted that on his bare feet. Now standing amongst the other guys, uh, from a distance it looks absolutely natural, white feet and so on, and uh, this guy could walk bare feet, he was a tough, tough, tough guy. And as the devil wanted it, the RSM came on the parade and he said, Staff Kutzer, you will be the marker. And he got to attention and he marched right up to the old man 
the RSM standing there, looking up. And when he halted, he didn't have traction on his feet, his bare feet, and he moved a few steps forward. And then the RSM saw this. I then, that whole parade was laughing. He couldn't get control over these guys. Obviously, the uh, world staff was just reprimanded. But I mean, this is just to say to you how the army developed. Uh, I think we got rid of the blue ties and shoe shine bare feet. Uh, into decent boots and decent tactics and running shoes and so forth. Now, in 1979, I was transferred from the combat school to 7 South African Infantry Battalion as the second in command. The battalion was based at Berkslak. It's in the uh, Mpumalanga area, the eastern Transvaal escarpment area. And we were based in an old hospital. The nurses' quarters was the single quarters. And the rest of the staff was uh, housed in, in mobile caravans. And there we were in this old hospital to train our troops for the border. We had a good training area and the surroundings. And honestly, every time uh, when you wake up in the morning and you go to work, it, feels if you're on a holiday because the nature is so kind to you. There were two rivers flowing through that area. And believe you me, the trout was very tame there. They bit at any hook. Um, and, and this is the surroundings that we were. Just a little joke before I get onto the training site. Uh, in the bottom company, it was normally Charlie Company, uh, was an old compound. We cleaned it up and so on, and the troops were based in these huts, but the mortuary was also there. And whenever the troops were naughty, they were locked up in that mortuary, and they begged us not to go in there because it was only these old uh, cement slabs there where the corpses were, were put. But we did it more in a, in a, in a joke. Uh, we never tortured the troops with that, and I think it's, it's, not, it's inhumane to do that. But uh, we always threatened them and said, okay, now we're taking you to the mortuary. No, 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 please. Uh, just a joke. It was really in jest. Uh, we started train doing training there. We received a, a basic uh, intake. And uh, I was then on the receiving side, seeing troops disappear to the paratroopers, uh, to various units. And you sit with a bunch of guys uh, that you had to train. Nothing wrong with them. Good, good troops, South African troops. Then, um, after about four months that I was there, we moved to Palaborva to the new base. Uh, some of the staff already stayed in Palaborva, and over weekends, uh, we went home, and early on a Monday morning, we used to come to, through to, to Berkslak and vice versa, till we all moved to Palaborva. And it was absolutely marvelous to step into a, a complete new base built for us. Not a second World War bungalow. The troops had specific uh, bungalows that uh, old platoons, two platoons could accommodate. And uh, we had all the facilities an officer's uh, mess, an NCO's mess, a warrant officer's mess, a very, very good sick bay. And uh, really, that was uh, a change, as they say, a change is as good as a holiday from Berkslak, uh, accommodation wise, to Palaborva. The unit was directly next to the Kruger National Park. And you could hear the lions roar and all these things. And one morning, it was after my time, the then officer commanding of Walter Swanepoel, he had to kill a lion that was trapped in the mud. He came down a, a downpipe uh, underneath the wire, but it was in, in, in the mud. And you don't uh, go to a lion and say, Kitsi, come here, come here, come here, here's a little bit of meat. Uh, and the question, of course, of, of the parks board, he had to be shot. And in the paper, it stood, stood the uh, headlines were 
and I'm going to say it in Afrikaans and then I'll translate it into, into English, because the emblem of 7SAI is, is the roikat or the caracal lynx. It's the most beautiful animal that you find uh, predominantly in, in, in the low field, the bush field, and uh, even uh, on the high field, you find them. It's the most beautiful animal, but as fierce as you can get. And it's a, it's a big, he's about three times the size of a normal domesticated cat. And the uh, headlines were Roy Katsabas is Leo City. In other words, the caracal lynx boss was the tiger of the lion. He could shoot the lion, uh, obviously with, with permission. Um, we had a very nice uh, training area adjacent to us, not very far from Palaborva, uh, but the place was as hot as hell. I remember during field training and preparing the troops for the border. At seven o eight o'clock in the morning, we had to stop training, and I discussed the heat exhaustion situation with you. Just to recap, it was a index that we got from a wet and a dry ball thermometer, and it was called the index, and we reached index four which meant that we had to stop all training and uh, people had to move un, uh, into shade. So that meant that we did all our training in the night. And you know, in the day, you can't sleep when it's so hot. It, it was very difficult. But we managed and the troops uh, went uh, to the operational area. And there I, I was when I speak about uh, five four battalion. I was on the receiving end of the troop that I trained myself. Uh, that that was really a very good experience. Uh, that that I could uh, see what we did was wrong and where was shortcomings, and uh, it it was very interesting. And uh, I think I was very fortunate to do that. Uh, the community of Palaborba was very friendly towards the. Uh, soldiers, uh, and uh, we really uh, had a very good battalion. I had a very uh, good battalion commander. Uh, he was a commandant, any shoots. He later also became a general. And um, really, the, the staff was good, and uh, the unit progressed. And my main task as second in command was to oversee the training. And um, I think uh, it went very well with the, with the troops and the staff, especially the leader group that we had there. They were very good. And I enjoyed my, my stay in Palaborla. In this year, I also did the pre-course for the staff course. I'm not going to embroider on that again. And uh, in closing on 7 South African Infantry Battalion, it was one of the top battalions later uh, in all our competitions we had between the, the units uh, when an inspection team came and inspected all the facets from personnel to training to your finances and all these things. That unit really excelled. Uh, but I think it had good commanders and uh, good staff. Now, an infantry battalion has got four companies plus minor 100 each uh, with a, a major or a captain. You know, sometimes people go on courses and so on, a major and a captain in charge of the company. And then you had your headquarters company, your support weapons. And uh, then, of course, your headquarters staff doing all the admin, personnel, finance, and medical. And uh, believe you me, that uh, sick bay uh, was very well designed. It had uh, a big re resuscitation rooms for heat exhaustion. And especially with the new intakes that, that came in. Uh, in a normal day that wasn't very hot, the troops got the heat exhaustion. But we could take them there quickly. And the uh, facility was fitted out with uh, air conditioners. And uh, we gave the troops enough, enough water to drink. We, we never lost the troop regarding uh, the situation 
uh, on uh, heat exhaustion. We had a detention facility, not a uh, just a facility. It wasn't a detention barracks where uh, people that were punished, they were just uh, in transit and we, we sent them to Pretoria. Mainly AWOLers and people who were found with, with criminal activities. So we didn't have the mortuary that we could <laughs> scare the guys with, but there was a real real detention facility. But uh, the place was, was mainly empty. But one had to have a thing, uh, a facility like that in, the, in, in a unit. Um, perhaps any questions on uh, the 7th South African Infantry Battalion? Can you tell me, sir, how big was this in manpower? Yes, uh, it, it, it varies, but uh, uh, just uh, sometimes so, uh, over a thousand. If you take your four, four companies, and especially when the intakes come in, you take your four companies and you take your HQ company, uh, you go up to 800, from 600 to, to 800 people. It's quite a lot of people. Uh, there is a big kitchen and the guys got uh, very good food. And, and uh, it was so nice to, to get into a base. And that's why I told you the story about the shoe shine and the tackies and, and, and the way the army was in the past. And to step into a, a well-designed uh, military base, uh, obviously designed by architects, but with the input of soldiers. Because the companies each had the demarcated lines. Uh, the headquarters was, was really very well designed with offices. Uh, the, the mess hall around this big kitchen, the sick bay, uh, helicopter landing strip, uh, everything was, was great and it was really great. Uh, you know, all the other South African infantry battalions were all based in Second World War camps like Lady Smith, Grangetown, uh, Wallfish Bay was, was now a different uh, story, uh, but it was all prefabs in, in Wallfish Bay at that stage, two South African Infantry Battalion, uh, one SAI in, in Bloemfontein, three SAI in Poch, so I can carry on. They were all based in, in, in old uh, military uh, bases uh, dating from the Second World War. And now here we step into this fantastic new base. Uh, perhaps that is why the unit really excelled. I uh, seem to recall, sir, that these army bases, even the police ones, were very, very neat. And wherever nature could be used, nature was used. It really looked like a, more like a camp, I suppose, than a fort. Oh, yes. No, uh, well, a base has got to be neat. Not only the soldier himself and his room and his ablutions and everything is got to, because hygiene is uh, very, very important. That can bring uh, an army absolutely down onto his knees without one shot being fired. Uh, even in Palaborwa, and this started in, in the time of, of, of uh, Voter Swanapu, uh, and you know, Palaborwa is the most fertile place, I think, <laughs> that's on earth. You can export the soil from that, from there. You can export it as fertilizer. And there was a park with uh, mock animals, elephants, and all these animals in the garden, in the rest camp. Uh, that was really very nice. And it looked like a holiday resort that part. And even with the troops, we planted grass, LM grass, uh, and it, Within a season, it, it was fully grown. Uh, obviously, it uh, received a lot of attention and water. But uh, the place was, was kept very nicely and, and neat. No rubbish and uh, nonsense lying around. You've got to do that. that, that, that that's part of, of, of soldiering, is, is to keep a place neat. We have... I've had some, some questions uh, from the viewers, and thank you for that. Uh, one lady wanted to know 
about the ablutions, about the toilets and the showers, uh, whether they were communal at all the bases or were there a little bit of privacy in some of them for the men now? Of course, majority uh, shower facilities were open. Uh, toilet facilities, uh, privacy was uh, uh, was of utmost uh, importance. Uh, when we went into the fields and uh, during training, uh, obviously we had the uh, temporary toilets, uh, a big hole in the ground with the, uh, it's a plastic based toilet, we call them go-karts. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that that was open. And then uh, for the urinals, we had these uh, mortar-like uh, lilies. Uh, and the reason for that is, is to, to curb uh, diseases. And, uh, you know, it attracts flies in this type uh, of diseases. We, we cannot uh, allow that. But in the bases, shower uh, open. Uh, but the toilet facilities were, were, were always private. Well, I'm grinning now, sir, because there is a story, and perhaps you can confirm or deny. But when you sit on this go kart, you are not supposed to flick your cigarette butt into the hole below your ass, because it might explode. <laughs> now, the reason for that is. Uh, when all the previous meals go in there, uh, it creates methane gas. Yes. It creates methane gas. No, uh, it so is you dangerous. Can, <laughs> you can actually get your ass and whatever dangles there can, can get burnt. I've, yeah. I've seen it. That's, that's why I'm now grinning here. You know, you always get these guys, they, they like to smoke, they sit there, they talk nonsense to each yeah. other. And, and they yeah. just forget, you know, it's not on purpose. <laughs> uh, that, that normally happens when it's uh, a long term, over three, four months. On a short term basis, when we go for a field exercise three weeks, then you cover those holes again. Or semi it becomes semi-permanent and then... Uh, but, but we've learned to have escape hatches for the methane gas to, to escape. I've seen this at Ongbangwa when uh, the uh, drain covers started exploding one day due to the, the gas that was trapped underneath. But that was at uh, the departure or the departure area people waiting to, to catch flights. You know, much uh, was said about that. But uh, the lesson we learned there is you, you must establish uh, escape holes for, for the methane gas. That's also the, the biggest threat to miners, especially in the older days, without good ventilation. That killed people. And uh, if you have one spark, it does, and then there's an explosion. Underground. No, methane gas. We, we walk to the canaries or something inside the. Yes, just... yeah, yeah, with the canary. Because but, the canary uh, inhales fifth, uh, no, uh, 25 times faster than the human being. And they detect this gas uh, very quickly. And then, of course, the old coal lamps, when they started glowing, they knew we were in trouble. We had to, we had to go back. But modern mining. And, and the same applies to the military with, with uh, ablution facilities. Uh, you must have very good ventilation. Now I must ask you another question, sir. Do you recall the Cider Christ forms? How will we very, very well. In English? Uh, very, very well. Fun. Fun. Can you tell us about yeah. them? And if any one of them is listening here, please, I would like to speak to you. Can you tell us what they were, sir? And then I'll tell you what I've heard. <laughs> It's a, it's a group of women, uh, Mrs. Albrecht was the chair lady of that, and they uh, gathered gift parcels for the soldiers up in, uh, on, on, on the border. It consisted of a, a few biscuits, condensed milk, and a knife, typical red knife 
uh, inscripted with Southern Cross Fund, Cedar Cross Funds. And that was given to the troops. They also gave a, a pouch with a writing pad and envelopes for the guys to, 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 to write home. No, it was always received very well wherever. And the troops called it Donkey Tani, the thank you, ma'am, parcels that, that, that came. But that was highly appreciated. That, uh, uh, Mrs. Albrecht did a great work and she was well rewarded uh, with a civilian award from the state president as well for the work that she and the ladies did. I, I've heard somewhere, sir, that of course you as an officer commanding or fairly high up in the, in the ranks, you would receive these tannies, uh, that is the word in Afrikaans for, for auntie. It, it, it's not meant in, in a bad way. No, no, it, no. It's no. respectful. It's, um, very, it's very respectful. Yeah, so, so, so you will receive these toddies when they arrive at your base and escort them around. I've heard that one of them then started asking what these lilies are. And I believe the officer explained it's like air holes for the guys under the ground. And then she talked in them. So is that true? I can see you're laughing. You I don't know whether that... I, 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 I don't know whether that's true. But uh, <laughs> this Mr. Schuster... Uh, made a film, uh, Here Comes Unta. And, and there was a, a scene where uh, I think it was officers from, from India asked, what is this? And he said, no, speak to the people underneath, they're working there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, there's, there's a lot of jokes about that. Yeah, well, there's a lot actually done for the troops on the civilian side. I know we're digressing or going a little bit away from Seven Side, but since we're talking about it, there were a few books as well. Uh, someone wrote a letter, what was it, Yanni? Uh, some letters which were written, quite funny, it was like a book. And then this yes, guy yes, would, yes, 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 I remember, write, I remember that. Yeah, he would write the silliest things back to the, uh, well, uh, why not? It, it, was, it was fun and games. Now I need to ask you, sir. I've heard a story somewhere that uh, Navy people do not need to salute if they're standing inside the building or they have something on top of, above their heads, like a floor or whatever. Uh, do you know if this is true or not? Of course, no. Uh, that I don't know. I know why the Navy uh, salutes like that with the open hand uh, to the ground. Because once a queen had to visit them with all the rope work, the, the uh, naval people had to do. There were blisters on their hands. and She didn't want them to, to see the hand like that, you know, to display that, that blistery, dirty hand. So they had to salute like that. Later, the army also came, came to it because it was a, an easier way to salute than the old English long way you stretch your arm and then you bring it up like this and then normally uh, it, it, it's a big problem. It's much easier to salute like that American way as well. Uh, so uh, what I, I learned from the Navy at, at, at the Naval Academy, they saluted uh, the uh, NCOs and warrant officers. They saluted their officers. Uh, in, while they were in civilian dress. That I learned there. And there, there's, there's nothing wrong, I think, with that. A salute stays a salute. It's to honor a, a higher rank. But, uh, yeah, I, I, so I, I'm not acquainted with the uh, saluting if you're in the building or, or so forth. Were you ever taught how to board a Navy ship, sir? Because they're very traditional, yes. full of nonsense, but as uh, you can tell. <laughs> no, uh, when, you, when you board a ship, you salute the ensign, you salute that country's flag, uh, irrespective of what rank you have and, and what's the rank of that captain. No, that is to greet the, to greet the ship and, and to salute uh, that ship. The moment you get off the gangplank or onto the ship, that specific moment, that's when you 
give a, give a salute. No, uh, uh, I visited many, many ships and even submarines. Uh, when you get on the submarine and there's a lieutenant in charge, you salute. You don't salute him. You salute the, the ensign, the, the, the flag of that ship, of the country that he comes from. But it's, it's, it's good manners. It's like going to a person's home. You enter the home, you greet him. It's the same thing. That's just a soldier's and an airman's way of greeting uh, the house, which is the ship now. When you were at Burke's Lock, is that not where they eat the Kruger millions? Uh, in my spare time, I, I looked, but I didn't find it. No, of course. Of course. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stories about that. Uh, there's a place in the potholes where there's a lot of cents and small coins that the people used to put in there as a wishing well. But look, that, uh, that area from Waterfall Boven was the time of Pope Creer uh, between the two uh, uh, Boer Wars. And, and the story is that it was there. And it's near Pelgen Rust, where the gold was found there in the, in the river. But uh, I'm just joking, because we didn't have time to, to look for, for, for gold. Well, I'm sure Even you... uh, while I stayed next to Smut's house in Irene, many people said, uh, look, uh, uh, this is where General Smuts hid the, <laughs> the gold from Paul Korea. But there I can assure you there's no gold there. Can you tell us uh, what? What's the procedure if you have a problem with a troop? Um, seven Sai, if I can remember correctly, it, it, a lot of national servicemen coming in. I know because one of our first guests on the show, Chris McCune, the, from one parachute battalion, he was actually a Palaborwa, and he tells the story that the commanding officer was a very nice man, very, very professional man. This was 86, so I think it was after you. And he yeah. said to them, look, if you want to, I will just don't climb over that fence there because then the lions will get you. That's part of a Kruger, Kruger National Park. And so when you told the story now about the lion, then we know that Chris was actually telling the truth. And Chris, if you're listening, yeah, thanks, mate. Not that we doubt at you. It's just interesting to me how things always seem to interweave with each other. So working with a national serviceman, sir, can you tell me about that? Because he's not a, a man yet in a sense. He's been at school a month ago, but he's not a child. And, and he's trying to be a soldier. How did you find him? Well, sir, that's a very interesting part of uh, being an officer in a unit when they get national servicemen. You see them get off the train. One guy dressed in a suit, another guy has got a bad attitude. Another guy gets off only with a toothbrush in his back pocket and a guitar around his neck. And that's my type of man because <laughs> he can survive and he can make music when, whenever it's needed. And then you get this poor little guy in tears and you get... Uh, the normal guy that tells you uh, I'm a scratch golfer and the other guy tells you I want to see the doctor immediately, I've got this problem. And uh, all of them have got a story. Like everybody of us, we've all got stories. And uh, the moment, and, and our policy was when they get off the train, we greet them decently, no shouting, no... Uh, swearing, but, but in, a, in a disciplined way, and they've got to adhere to things. And getting into the vehicles or buses like we, we had there at Berkslak and Palaborva, uh, and then we take them to the unit. And uh, by means of a very good organization of getting them to clear in and to get their kit and to orientate them, is the first way of showing them just business. You must show them that, that they come into a well-developed oiled machinery. There's no hurry up and wait and this, this type of thing. 
And uh, the ones with problems, they come out and you sort out the problems. We've heard all the stories by now. Um, the ones with the genuine stories, they, they get uh, pointed to. And, and normally, when there's an intake, there's always a team from uh, Pretoria or wherever. Uh, the doctors looking at the medical side, it's a team of doctors. It's not only one old doctor sitting there. Uh, there's always a, a welfare officer, well, a unit had a welfare officer, but they just step it up. And then there are people that, that look into their personnel problems. So those guys can uh, sort out the technical side of this intake. And then we start. And then the corporal and the sergeant comes in, and then they take them through the steps of basic training. And you can see how this young man develops into a soldier. The basis uh, of it all is good discipline. And you, you must treat him well, but disciplined. And you must feed him well. And you must uh, get stressed. And there's no something around that waking them up uh, every two hours and this. They're not on a selection course. They're on a basic course. Later, these things can come. But with uh, good management, you turn them into a fighting machine. That's the main thing. And they must have respect for you and you must also have respect for them. And the other thing is you must move amongst them and you must speak to them. Informally, if they've got a smoke break, you must speak to them. Uh, and when there's a, uh, we had uh, constant periods uh, where the officer commanding addresses the troops on various topics and so forth. And then, of course, the church parades and so on. And they give the man his due. And those who do wrong and uh, who overstep the line, they must be punished accordingly. Not jungle justice. Uh, and uh, that is the way uh, you train a young man, only the toothbrush in his back pocket and the guitar around the neck to become a corporal or a lieutenant. And they, they become good guys. Now, the June pool in South Africa, black and white, is good. And now, people that does the training must just do their, their part to train them. But the potential is there. I can hear that you're proud of these men, sir. Of course. Nothing wrong with our guys. Here and there, there was a, a spirit and a naughty guy. But overall, and you know, of course, you learn this when you go into battle with them. Then you, then you see them. You look in their eyes. Have you ever heard, sir, of troops, young troops, national servicemen being beaten physically by, by the corporal? Yes. Oh, yes. It happens. Uh, it happens, but uh, there you must act very strictly. Uh, they call it corporal punishment, but that's when you uh, hit a guy on his backside. That's really the corporal punishment in the old days. And the, the corporal there means the body. Punish the body. And assaults and swearing, uh, that's not done. That is not done. Uh, this is not the way you treat the soldier. Therefore, we put a discipline code and you treat him with a with the necessary di discipline. Uh, and, and, and corporals and lieutenants are, are trained to, uh, this is part of their training at the infantry school. So if you, find, if, if you as a commander so find out that one of your corporals actually punched one of the, one of the troops, what will you do? Uh, immediately charge him. And then an investigation, a proper investigation is done. Either a, a board of inquiry, if it's a serious business, and you get various, uh, and, uh, uh, various witnesses, that can turn into a preliminary investigation. And that it's, it's like in the civilian court course. Uh, you you uh, uh, compile a charge sheet, and then he's court-martialed. Uh, and the punishment of a court-martial for assault is, is here, yeah, degrading of rank, uh, then sent to detention barracks, depending on, 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 on the 
the seriousness of, of this crime, or he could get a reprimand or a, or, a, or a fine or whatever it is. And if the guy is a permanent force member, uh, demerit is immediately done. He can lose a year or two getting his promotion. And uh, But you've got to enforce this type of thing. Uh, you cannot uh, assault it. For instance, at, at, at drilling, and this guy's drill is not up to standard. Then you hit him with a pay stick or you... You, you give him a smack. Uh, that's not done. This is now a little less serious. But when you get stuck into him with your fists, and you know what, what happens if you start, if the corporal starts hitting these guys with a fist, some of them are good boxers and then they hit back. And then you, you can't allow that like, like our rugby going on from time to time that the guys sort of greet each other. You can't, you can't allow that. That's why the leaders always got to be 100% online with his discipline. You, 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 you can't allow that. Uh, we train soldiers, and, and soldiers are not there to be, to be bullied. Now, uh, we were very, very strict uh, about these things. And there, there, there are instances that are swept under the curtain. These, these things happen. And uh, also, the army policy was, was very, 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 very strong not to assault or swear at troops or degrade them. So, sir, if somebody says that the South African Infantry Battalion is run on fear, then that's not quite true, is it? If it's, if it's run on fear, you won't have good operational troops. Uh, and this is uh, when it happens that... Uh, we, we see the American movies of Vietnam where they shoot the officer and they kill the sergeant, this, this type of thing. Uh, you must train the guy, you must set the example, then you've got it. You, you, you can't by means of fear uh, because this the officer or the sergeant or whoever he is, if he... Uh, manages his platoon or company with fear, they go into battle, you've got a problem. You've really got a problem. Why, from the troops point of view, why must I that, uh, sacrifice my life and this guy is at me and he's not here with me and, 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 and uh, I fear him. Uh, you don't get a natural operational guy when, when you uh, do with fear, when, when you manage with fear. So there's a difference between fear and discipline. It's not the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. Discipline is, is coordinated. It's a set rule and there are boundaries. But when you, uh, when you come to fear, uh, and uh, especially from the, and I'm talking of an officer now, to his subordinates, you are out of the boundary. You are definitely out of that boundary. Uh, your men must look up to you, and they must follow you. Uh, you mustn't uh, shout at them and swear at them. Uh, that, that won't happen. In, in battle, these things do, do, do happen, but that's in battle. Where you raise your voice and uh, you've got to motivate the guys to go go forward. But if you train with him, uh, there's no problem with that. May I ask you, sir, and I know I'm going back many years now, but how fit would the infantry soldier be by the time that you are done with him, that is operational? You know, fitness is a, a debatable point uh, because you can be fit for athletics and you can run the Comrades Marathon and you can, uh, a, a boxer can go 15 or 12 rounds. I mean, these, these guys are physically fit. But the soldier's fitness is measured that he can walk this, uh, a long distance with a pack on his back, and that any time 
at any time, you must be ready to, to fight and to combat the enemy. And the main fitness lies between the ears, mental fitness. I'm not talking about uh, brainwashing and indoctrination. That's not done. But there the fitness lies. We, we, to, to, to get this guy motivated. But coming down to, uh, we, we did a test of, of one, uh, 2,4 kilometers. Uh, and that was a, a marginal test that, that, that we could do. And uh, at least between 10 and 12 minutes for that 2,4 uh, kilometers running with kit with your rifle, with your steel helmet on your, on your head. Uh, and then remember that guy must be able to shoot as well. Uh, he, he must be able to do a good grouping, preferably a two inch grouping. Then he's absolutely a marksman, but at least he must hit the target. I'm talking about that little small target on, 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 on the frame, uh, because that, uh, that's important. He must have observation. He must know his enemy. He must be well trained, and 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 he must be motivated. That's the fitness that a soldier must 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 go to. So uh, I always tell the guys, uh, not now. I'm uh, I do a lot of walking, but uh, I don't run run anymore. Uh, and they say, "Yeah, oh, you fit them." All these things. I said, "Yeah, okay." Uh, I'm not the fastest guy over the 100 meters, but uh, you tell the distance that we walk, and I'll tell you the weight on the pack, because there lies the thing. There lies the situation. Remember, an infantryman is a guy who you hang things on. And of course, it's not just walking, sir. When you walk a patrol, you actually are not just walking. In fact, no, you, are, you are scanning, you're looking for an enemy. You, you're observing, you're looking for signs, you are listening, uh, you are smelling, you are using all your senses. It's, it's a lot of walk in the park. And, 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 and uh, you, you fall part of the control, because the control leader must, uh, of, of the section must control his section, and the commander, the platoon, and the company commander of the company. Uh, and you must control them. You can't just one guy walks that side, this one goes that side, but he must go according to a plan. So it's a sort of walk in the park. So it's it's a matter of practice. You know your patrol formation, you know you have to keep it, and you will know what practice to do if training. somebody shoots at you. Practice training and then, of course, uh, experience. That's the main thing. No. Now we see today, most of the NATO militaries, the Russians are getting there as well, they have these optical sights, very fancy things on their rifles. Um, I have reports, which I can show to people if they don't believe me, what I'm going to say now, but at one stage in Vietnam, the Americans were shooting out 250,000 bullets for every dead person they could show. I say person because it's long not sure it's actually a Viet Cong. And then, would you believe, so I have read other reports recently, which is so unbelievable, but uh, in a place like Iraq, Afghanistan, to show one dead terrorist, if he's a terrorist, which I doubt, 500,000 bullets. Now, I'm not saying one guy or one platoon is shooting 500,000 bullets. I don't have that many with it. But I am saying overall statistics, and that shows to me extremely bad marksmanship, like in pathetically bad. Now I have to ask you, sir, how good was the average South African infantry battalion soldier of marksmanship once you're done with it? Of course, they, they were good. We had good instructors to teach them musketry. Uh, and uh, it's not only on the range. There's a thing called uh, Bush Lane, where you take him through a demarcated path in the bush with certain targets. And then they also do field firing. And then they do bush firing 
uh, as on a patrol uh, with, with active live ammunition. And then you teach them uh, fire and move. The uh, Indigenous uh, had, a, had a way uh, we call the double tap. If you shoot at a, at a bush, uh, you find two shots. And the, the other thing that, that I learned from him uh, is to keep both eyes open. Not close the one eye as we learn on the on the range. You close the one eye and your master eye. If you right-handed, uh, your right eye is uh, uh, looking over the sights onto the target. But this is now bush firing. It's not firing on the range. You you keep both eyes open, and uh, you learn. And this is what what's been done in training. You teach a guy where does the opponent stand. Behind a bush, he lies behind a branch. Uh, what's, what's the position? You must always look up in the trees because there's sometimes a marksman. And, and these are the final tips. And you know, the more our leader group went to the border, the operational area, the better they could train the troops again. Because every time you learn a lesson, with experience. So uh, here in the in the middle 80s, we really had experienced instructors with good uh, operational experience. Uh, and the better the training was then, most definitely. Can you tell me so, about uh, No, I'm listening, sir. Sorry if I interrupted you. No, uh, but... Uh, the basis starts at musketry, and it starts on the range. To know your weapon, with just the wind, and this type of thing. And we've learned one thing: was normally on the range, uh, the troops were chased, run to the 500 meter and come back, go to the butts, and do this, and do push-ups. We made it calm, we left them, and uh, yeah, you had to shout. Uh, loud dealer that everybody could hear because they had earplugs in their ears. And uh, this is the way how you teach a guy to shoot. Not by shouting and hitting him and this type of thing. And this is also what, what, what we've learned in later life. I often felt um, sympathy for the range officer. So, you know, it's a, it's a dreadful responsibility. Perhaps you can tell us about it. I'm sure you've been a range officer yourself many, many times. Yeah, you don't want an accident on a range because there are many bullets flying around there. But the main thing is good radios between the range officer and, and uh, the people in the buds and, and on the firing. Uh, and uh, good communication with the troops, as I said, with the loud hailer. And then good discipline. And the main thing is after each exercise to clear the weapons because a bullet can always stay behind and he turns around and he kills his, the man next to him. You can't afford that. And these things have happened on ranges. And normally the poor range officer, the officer in charge of that uh, shooting exercise, his uh, neck is on the block. Uh, no, it's a, it's a dangerous place on the range. You don't play around. You don't play around. So when the uh, young man, when the young man arrives there, the army will issue him his own personal rifle. Yeah. And he keeps that rifle so until something goes wrong with the rifle or with him. That's, that's, that's correct. Yeah. No, that's his rifle. That number is, is sort of uh, tattooed onto him. And uh, when he leaves the army, he gives, it, he, he gives that rifle back. Because that rifle is adjusted, you know, the, the, the front sight is, is adjusted, the rear sight is adjusted. And uh, you must maintain that rifle, clean it after every exercise, look after it, uh, rifle inspection, look at the butt and everything on the frequent. You've got to check these things every day. Now I must ask you, sir, what is the chances of this young soldier getting hold of life ammunition during uh, practice? Right. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. No, he can. That, that can happen, Chris. Uh, because, you know, the seven suits to ammunition is very 
uh, nice to have with your CO8 hunting rifle. And uh, our ammunition is very good and it's cheap. Now, uh, uh, we do inspections. Uh, and obviously, uh, say for instance, this exercise has got 10 rounds. Then every, every guy must have 10 rounds. It's been checked. He can shoot uh, eight rounds and then say, sorry, I must do and two. He can put in his pocket. This can happen. But then afterwards, they declare uh, after each uh, exercise that got nothing. And if, if that ammunition is found on him, he's got a big problem. That's, that's a very serious situation. Is Because what does he want to do with that ammunition? Hunting? Mischief? Or... Does he want to commit a crime, a bank robbery, or whatever the case might be? So uh, I'm not talking about the extreme. So you've got to, you've got to, and then spot checks. You know, if you finish on the range, get their kit, get them to dip out their pockets, uh, and and they must know they're going to be checked. They can't uh, steal. Uh, ammunition. And then, uh, of course, the inspections. We have your morning or weekly inspection or the officer commanding's inspection. You must check for these things. And the hidden places, normally in the bathrooms and toilets, that's where they, they hide it during inspection. They, they're not stupid to keep it within their trunk or amongst their kit. But that's, that's important. Uh, you've got to control. And uh, uh, afterwards, you've got to consolidate the ammunition that you've used and the ammunition that you've given back and these things must tell you up we always had to clean that process after we were shooting um, we actually went and we picked up every single one of them as far as we could find them and then hand them in uh, what role would that play in logistics why were we doing it uh, because that gets recycled. Yes. Today, if I can uh, get a 200 kilogram bag of uh, spent cartridges, I'll go and hand it in at the scrap dealer and I'll get a lot of money because the copper uh, is, is, is very scarce. You know, copper is used in the electronic world and all over. I mean, everything that you sort of having your household has got an amount of copper. And copper is expensive. And uh, that that was for recycling to be given. I know uh, even in my day, there were people found uh, loading this in their cars and taking it home and taking it to the scrap metal. Uh, the, these things happen. It's got, a, it's got a value. Of course, it's got a value. It's got a second-hand value. Uh, you got to and that's part of the range officer's work is to control that as well. And what they also do is in the butts, the lead and the copper jacket, uh, in, in the stop wall at the back of the butts, people go and dig that uh, for sinkers of uh, when they want to go fishing, or they even sell the lead or the copper. Yeah, that, that's done, but that's now after hours that they do. And uh, that, that, I think, is also control. So it seems to me, sir, that you as, a, as the second in command there, a sort of control about everything, including whatever is inside that vehicle. Sorry, the, the, the unit. It will be the vehicles, the, the bullets, the everything. I'm, I'm curious to know, sir, you should know if you have, say, a 800 new recruits arriving. How many bullets are you going to shoot out in the next three months? How many hand grenades? How many RPGs? How many LMGs? All those things. So would you know in your head basically how many of these bullets and, and uh, what do you call it in English? Well, it doesn't matter. These bullets and things. How many of them you should have on your base? Yes, yes, yes. Prior to your uh, intake, uh, you do a budget and then you request the, the ammunition. And that's either by vehicle or by train. It, it comes and then it goes into the safeguarded uh, facility of the unit. 
it's it's placed there and you uh, prior to an exercise you go and draw the amount that, that's allotted to you and you do your exercise you carry on but it's part of a budgeting process and uh, and overall on a yearly basis you also budget for that uh for your yearly budget that, that uh, had to be and that all goes right up to the uh, national defense force budget so we we learn to budget for, for it's not just a matter of just going draw bullets and ammunition or whatever the case might be so if you don't shoot it out so you will run out of space to keep it yeah yeah no, you will Oh, well, obviously, if your intake is smaller than you budgeted for, uh, you just compensate with the next uh, intake, intake, not to over budget and to, to have more ammunition. Is it possible, sir, that somebody can start stealing at a great scale? Let's say Land Rover engines or, or anything there in the workshops of your unit without you finding out at some stage? Of course, yeah, this, this happens. This this has happened. Uh, I've got experience of that, uh, and uh, sometimes the people are forced. Uh, you know, the same with the spent cartridges. It's got a monetary value. The engines have got a mon monetary value. Tires have got a monetary value, and these things you must check uh, every day. It's a it's a difficult job, and the people in charge of of uh, the the light workshop troops or the transport people. Uh, they they must also check, and uh, you must, as, as 2IC, and, and especially the officer command, you must oversee this. Uh, no, uh, we, we've had various, various people uh, stealing engines, uh, even petrol. Uh, yeah. It's a sort of a betrayal of the honor, isn't it? It's a betrayal of honor. Absolutely. It, it really should be dealt with. And another thing is rations, uh, stealing rations. Did the South African army uh, ever uh, had something like a political commissar, like we would have found in the Soviet Union? No, not at all. That job was the job of the officer commanding, the company commanders, and the platoon commanders to convey certain messages. I'm not talking of political indoctrination. I'm not talking about uh, brainwashing. Uh, these were things that uh, we had to tell the troops and to inform them. But never, never, ever, uh, it, it was on a political, a party political stance. No, never. But we didn't have a political commissar. I know the term and I know what they do in the uh, Russian bloc uh, countries. I know how they function. I, I've studied that. But most definitely we didn't have a political commissar like that. Is there anything which I, which I forgot to ask you about Seven Sai, which perhaps you want to tell us? No, I think we've covered the uh, vast... Uh, ground on, on, on the subject. Well, thank you, sir, because I think it, it's the desire of every officer to be in command. And if it's not that desire, then I'm not sure he should be an officer, to be honest. We can talk about that because in the next episode, you become, a, I believe, a battalion commander and you are in the operational area. And we'll speak about that one in the next episode. For all of you listening here, watching us, writing us latest, as I always say to you, thank you very much. Uh, there was Andre van Rooyen. Andre, you were making very, very good comments. Thank you for that. We notice these things. And uh, for those of you who bought SW's book, thank you for that as well. But remember, please go and write us a good review somewhere. Because there will be some people who will write snot reviews, and you know what? Um, that doesn't help. So if you read the book and if you enjoyed the book, please don't just tell us about it. We, we know it's a good book. We wrote it. But um, please go and write a review for somewhere so that people know about it. And if you ever want to talk to us here, you're more than welcome. Say that Christ, Tonis, or Sublief. 
as dalk jou ma was, was het dan nie gewees vir haar gewerk het, of hoe jy nou somebody, please come and talk to us, I really think we should be on this show. Until we meet again, God bless. Thank you, Chris.